I think if you feel the, the draw to something, you need to do it. If you look back, you know, if I would have done all that and, you know, I retire happily at 65, 70 years old, right? I'm like, what if I didn't? What if I did this thing? And could I have, could I have won these championship events that I, that I really, you know, that my heart called yeah. to, you know, and I did. So it's, it's worth it. So it's like, you got to go pursue whatever you want to pursue. And otherwise you never know. And I think that's the worst thing you could ever do to yourself. No whining. No quitting. Overcome. No Community, teamwork, tougher together. Hey, hey, to all my mother family, OCR brothers and sisters, and to you listening right now, you are my people too. We do share a world. And I am your mirror man and host of Tough Mudder's No Excuses podcast, Sean Corvell. In this episode of No Excuses, we are talking to 2022 World Toughest Mudder Men's Champion, DJ Fox. David Joseph Fox can be described as a blue collar champ, the people's champion, because we see a part of ourselves in him. He certainly reflects those qualities we all want to recognize in ourselves. And he shows us how with grit, hard work, commitment and a strong support team, we can make possible whatever we want to accomplish. And with him, it's on a limitless level. In our conversation, we recap DJ's 2022 WTM race experience and talk about what drove him to endure 24 plus hours, 21 laps, 105 miles of cold weather, tough obstacles, a challenging terrain, and a rattlesnake faster than any other human that weekend to end up on top of the first place podium. We talk about what he did differently from his 2021 effort when he placed third, He tells me about the Ultra House. And as with all our guests, we learn a little more about him personally. DJ has a flair and swag to his character and the ability to have a genuine connection with people. This contributes to his being as talented a coach as he is an athlete. Here's my conversation with DJ Fox on No Excuses. Hey, hey, mutters, here we are talking to DJ Fox. Yeah, what's World Tough. Yes, yeah, say hello to the community, man. Always. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, uh, nice to, let me get nice the title out real quick. World Toughest Mudder Champion, Men's Champion this year, killed it. Uh, it was awesome watching you run into the, the finish line all night long. That same energy. There was a few of y'all that were just like from another planet, man. But it, it, it was like quite inspiring to watch. I think I wrote you that when I asked you to be on the uh, on the podcast. Uh, let me say up front, too, to any of my listeners, I was checking out uh, a previous interview that DJ did with Obstacle Running Adventures podcast and also with Race Brain, who were doing a recap on World Toughest Mudder event. These guys are technically smarter than I am with the whole running thing and the whole running world. And uh, they did a great interview and great information on the race. I encourage everybody to go and check them out or any of our OCR podcasts out there, because this is a growing sport, and I want to support everybody out there that is supporting it. With that being said, DJ, my man, thank you for being on here. How are you feeling today as we speak? I'm feeling, yeah, I'm feeling good. Uh, I've been really beat up for the past two weeks. We're two weeks and a day out from the race. Uh, I've done a lot of rest and recovery, but today I'm feeling... I'm feeling mostly like myself, like a human, like I can actually get out in the world and start doing some things. So I'm happy. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that, man, that you guys are human, because, again, what you're doing <laughs> is just to me is like when I watch Circus Soleil, you know, I'm like, humans can do that. Oh, man, I got to get up off yeah. the couch, you know, <laughs> and you're <laughs> yeah, around. Yeah, you're you're around these people a lot. You know, you get you're around these elite runners and uh, ultra guys. So I don't know. Is it still amazing to you when you see what you guys are doing out there? Oh, absolutely. Because I mean, I look back at what I was doing over the past five years or so, and the growth has been, it's been incredible, right? So it's just like, put your head down and get to work. And then as you start to improve, um, you kind of get like welcomed into these circles, these tighter circles of people who are performing it at higher levels, right? And to see what they're doing and, and how they smash these events and how some of them are able to recover and get right back to it, right? Like you were talking about, uh, some of the other the other competitors in the race and and they were they were competing the following week while I was doing my best hobbling around the house and, and trying to put myself back together which I'm 
that's just, I think it's partially the fact that my longevity or not my longevity, but my lifespan in the sport has been, it's, it's not very vast yet. Right. Like I'm, I'm fairly new to endurance sports. So I mm-hmm. think with some more volume and time, time on my feet, I'll start to bounce back a little bit quicker like these guys, but it, it's really amazing to watch somebody go out and run hundred miles. And then the following weekend, go and compete at something like DECA, like, like Chris Roglowski did. It was, you know, I'm like, like I said, I was, I was just starting to, just starting to walk, walk around again. So. <laughs> yeah. Chris, uh, Chris is our female, uh, champion. And yeah, she was the first female, in fact, to break the hundred mile mark. Congratulations to her. Inevitably, yeah, it was going to be done, you know, but she did it first and, and just represented well, man. So, uh, do you know Chris at all? Not personally. No, I've spoken to her a little bit since the race, but that's it. Yeah. I'm sure I'll, I'll run into her again in the future here. See, and compared to sports in the whole sports world, I, and I do consider this a sport. It is a growing sport, but a very young sport. And you are, whether you consider yourself or not, you are among the, in my opinion, the, and a lot of people's opinion, the elite athletes in this sport. You guys are like, sort of like that, I don't know, maybe first wave. You know, it's a very young sport of athletes. You guys will be the, the LeBron James and the Serena Williams <laughs> kids will be looking up to that come into this sports. Yeah, I want to be like DJ. I saw DJ run and that got me up. I'm like, hey, I might not be a basketball player or, you know, a, a hockey player, but man, I, I got this thing I can run and I've got grit. And DJ, he's the man that inspires me. So you, my friend, whether you know it or not, are an inspiration for uh, some some young athletes coming in to this sport. Well, like, I hope you feel that. Yeah, um, I, I really like that idea, and I hope that's the case. Because, I mean, like you had mentioned the Race Brain podcast, right? And one of the gentlemen on there, Kirk Dwint, had called me the working man's champion. And I resonate I heard with that. that. I, don't, I, don't have, I, have, I have no issues with that. I think that's fine because I... I'm not supremely talented in this. I didn't come in and I couldn't run 100 miles off the bat, right? Like I, I busted my butt and I worked really hard to get where I'm at. I put, I did put the work in, um, and I think it is a testament that you know you can do this if if you put your head down and and do everything you possibly can, right? Like, I mean, currently, like this year, I 100% committed myself to the sport. I took it full time. I moved from New York to Colorado to do the best I possibly could. Right. So I have, yeah, I I invested. Right. And, and I like the fact that, that they, they know it took work to get here. Right. Like I didn't, I didn't walk in and, and instantly become the world champ. Right. I, I put my head down and put my nose to the grindstone and made it happen. Yeah. Yeah, People see that. I I really do. Um, it's nice. And, you know, I just, people can you you lay out a path and then people can people can follow it and not to say that i 100 percent blazed this trail i've followed other people along the way as well right but just you know yes. keep keep learning from other people and and there is a template out there yeah you are uh part of the people that are blazing this trail though so and i like that yeah i agree with him you know the people's like the people's champion you know and that uh <laughs> you're one of those guys that are out there because again Clint, myself and Jason, we were the MCs and we try to hang out there for the whole 24 hours, catching you guys come in and out, you know, and, uh, you are one of those guys that were out there when you come in still very sociable, you know, still, I mean, as much because some of the, some of the competitors, they come in, they don't even see us. They're just focused. You know, they look angry. They look like, you know, they about to pick <laughs> up their sword and hit back out and kill something, you know, but you came yeah. in, you know, it's just same pace. A uh, good look, always acknowledging us, you know, what's up? A little fist bump, a little hug every now and then if you had a time, you know. So that's what I love about this sport that that people like you are introducing to the sport is that, um, and I had said this before, uh, I like watching the, the Tour de France, you know, and, and certain bike races. And I remember one of the commentators on there was saying that one of the charms of this sport is that the comp- the fans of the sport, they get to be so close to their athletes, you know, when they're standing on the side of the road, our fans, they get to be right there on the course with you guys, our elite athletes. How do you feel about that? Do they get in your way? Do you like it? What's the deal on that for you? Yeah, I think it's special 
it's it's a huge morale boost to to run around um, and you know do as many laps as I possibly can and, and see the same people over and over and over again. And then they start to recognize you a little bit more, and you get some encouragement, and and you help out. Um, a couple of other competitors get over obstacles, and they help you as well. It's just like everybody's there to do the same thing, and that is just do the best you possibly can on the day, and and that's beautiful. And to be able to share that with somebody who wants to go and get a 25 mile bib, 50 mile bib, 75 mile bib with somebody who, who wants to go out and win the whole thing. It's, it's uh, there's nothing like it. There's absolutely nothing like it. I, I really enjoy that aspect of, of this sport. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. You're, you're in it to win it. So you're in there for the competition. Uh, what is the percentage of crush the competitors personal best? Um, always personal best, always. And then the cards were fa- will fall where they're supposed to. Always personal best. That's the goal to go out and you know I hopefully you know beat myself from last year or yesterday every day, right? And then you'll you'll continue to grow and you don't have to worry about other people racing in this event. And I think it's a mistake too um, if you just focus on yourself and be like, I'm gonna run my best 24 to 25 and a half hours, then nothing else around you matters. I think that's the way you should approach this. Yeah. And then it went to like, let's say like the last like two hours of this year's race, it turns into a little bit of like crush the competitors once you're actually in the mix. Um, Yeah. Once you're racing, like I heard Trevor Psycho say once, like the race doesn't start until you're 16 hours in. So just run and just stay consistent and do your thing for then. But then it's like, oh shoot, I'm in third place, right? Like run away from fourth now. Don't let him catch me. And then you get second, you do the same thing. And then you see first and you're like, okay, now it's now I can be real competitive. I'm going to work hard. I've gotten to this spot and I'm not going to lose it. So there's a mix of everything, but it's definitely greatly weighted towards do your best. Yeah. For anybody that uh, is listening to the podcast for the first time or not familiar with the World Toughest Mudder uh, race, it is a 24-hour obstacle mud race. That our competitors and people like you said out there just looking to get their personal best. They're out there on the course. The, the target is to be out there for the whole 24-plus hours. And um, for our competitors, it's to place, of course, and um, which people don't get. You know, layman's people, they're like, what, 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 why would people let's do that, you know? <laughs> why would people do that, DJ? Uh, to test you're those people to find out yeah, yeah to find out yeah. what you can do my original pull towards something like this was just like i wonder if i can um you know i, I went out and i ran a mile one day right and it's like oh, i could probably run two and i could probably run three and five and ten and I'm like, okay like how far does this actually go when do you need to stop and things like that right and that that threshold is always constantly moving and it's you know chasing the dragon in a sense right and it's it's a really fun endeavor yeah like the first first bit is to test yourself tell test your will test your drive and your grit that was my yeah. initial draw so i think that's a lot of people they just want to they want to know what they got you know and this is a perfect playing field and the perfect battlefield to find out especially when you got people there everybody's in the same mindset it's easy to like put your head down and get to work when the person next to you has their head down and they're working. People drive each other. Um, I had heard somebody else saying too that you were an underdog in this race. Did Always. you ever feel that? <laughs> because I heard you on other uh, talking about it on other things. You were kind of confident coming in. You were feeling good coming in, man. So did you hear oh, people yeah. saying you were an underdog? Did you have a feeling like that? Yeah, I mean, I think like last year, um, I. I still ran 105 miles and I placed third and nobody knew my name at all. I had re- I registered as David, which is my first name. And um, like all my friends and pit crew call me DJ running around. So like, who's David? We don't even know this person running up the leaderboard. And I'm like, perfect. I love to come out of the shadows and, and sneak attack in a sense, right? Doing some guerrilla warfare in, in this one. And then, you know, people were talking this year about how, you know, I think it was yeah, Bracken from Race Brain now had said <laughs> DJ Fox most under appreciated athlete in obstacle course racing like who lands third in a world competition and then doesn't get the fanfare they deserve and to me like it's fine it's whatever like i'm you say what what do you deserve right and like i don't know you put the work in and and if if things come to you then they come to you right so and with the 24-hour spartan 
championships being canceled this year. I knew a lot of people were going to come. The competition was going to, was going to get thick. And I really liked that idea. And I knew that with the caliber of athlete that was coming to this event that I would get tucked back under the rug and I'm totally fine with that. That doesn't bother me at all. I know what I did all year. I know the commitments and the sacrifices that I made to, to perform at this event. You know, um, I was telling the people around me, I'm like, I could win this one. You know, I'm confident. I put the work in, I did everything I possibly could. And I don't care who shows up on the day. I'm coming home, coming home with the babe. I'm coming home champ. So I was confident. Yeah. (laughs) And you did, man. You did a great job. On these 24 hour events so long there's so many variables and like that's always in your mind right like i have both of my my roommates um you know one how i got cold and probably just lack of experience in the event um that's anthony if he comes back he's going to absolutely smash the thing now that he's got a rep under his belt and then my buddy josh reed and, and training partner heard his leg coming off of an obstacle and those are two of my biggest competitors out there, which is exciting. I, I know what they do. I watch them train all the time. So you just never know what's going to happen over the course of 24 hours. But I was ready. I was confident. Yeah. I was like, I just kept saying, if I have a good day, I'm going to have a great day. Yeah, because it's not just about speed, man. I mean, that attrition and grit, as I said before, the mental challenge in that is, is, if not more, just as much as the physical challenge of it. How taxed were you mentally from this event? Um, I would say that's my strongest attribute, um, when it comes to the mental side of things, <laughs> it's they call me like when we get into like deep workouts and things like this, like, oh, DJ's just going to go Terminator mode. It doesn't even matter. Um, talking to Anthony before the event, he's like, I need to get, I need to lap you twice. Cause if you're within striking distance at the end of this thing, he's like, I know you're just not going to stop. And then that, I think that's, that's me. Um, I could, I could be in a little bit of duress. Mm-hmm. Let's call it like, it was like nine, 10 hours into this thing. I started to get very uncomfortable. My legs hurt real bad. I thought like, okay, maybe I went out too high. Blew, um, blew up my quads. And I don't know what's going to happen for the rest of this thing. Like maybe maybe I burned it a little, a little too early here, but it never got any worse, but it never got any better. And I just kind of dealt with it. And I'm that's me. I'm, I'm going to put my head down. I'm going to get to work. So I would say I was the least mentally taxed um, in regards to like how my overall being was after this event, my body was beat up. I put it, I put it through a lot. So that's my strong seat. That's my strength. How many world toughest mutters have you competed in? Two. 2021, 2022. And 2021, you took third in 2021. And like you said, again, broke the hundred mile. So now you've got some experience here. You, you know what it feels like, you know, the, what, what you did wrong the last time or what you could do better. Maybe you didn't do anything wrong with that experience. What was different this year for you than the previous year? Yeah, this year I came in significantly fitter than I did in 2021. Um, I was in the mind state that I could be competitive. I could, I could win the event. And the course was significantly more challenging. And that's why I think the mileage lined up 105, 2021, 105, 2022, 2021. It was warm out. I think the low got to like 56 or 58 degrees. So no wetsuit needed. Um, pits were able to stay, you know, short. I didn't have the, the wetsuit change that I did this year. Yeah. Cause this year it was, I think the low got to 30 degrees. I feel like the obstacles were a little bit more difficult as well. Like the grip intensive aspect of it was really challenging on, on the upper body. Um, so that forced you to either, you know, use bands in non time consuming obstacles, but, but challenging obstacles, or you had to take the penalties. Right. And some of those were actually pretty challenging this year as well. So the course, the course was a lot harder and it, if, you know, we saw that people were dropping out like crazy as things really got challenging. So yeah, I think that was the biggest, (laughs) the biggest difference between this year and last year. Last year, too, 2021, we were out in the desert. We were in uh, Laughlin, Nevada. Oh, yeah. And uh, I know that they had some soft sand out there that kind of like slowed mm-hmm. people down that was pulling on the hip flexors. Uh, when you're running, because I feel like this is one of those sports where you, you do sort of, um, you, you really connect with the environment that you're in. You know, uh, almost like it has that same thing, almost like surfing, where it can become spiritual out there for you, especially 
three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning, you know. Uh, yeah. The, the sand from last year being out in the desert and then this one was more trails and uh, in the green and roots and creeks and all that. What was more challenging for you? Um, so the running this year, I would say was a little bit easier. The trail itself was more runnable, not as many steep climbs that there was last year. Like the climbs were were short last year, but they were steep and they were loose sand. Right. So it was like kind of dunes and it just like took all the momentum out of you. So you had to, you had to hike those or walk those. And this year there was no real section that was like, okay, this is the walking section. Right. Um, everything was, was really runnable. Um, so last year was difficult with the loose sand. And I think that really got to people, like you said, like the hip flexors started to go and things like that. And I just kind of let the course dictate what's going to happen for me. Um, I run everything off of effort. I'm not really worried about pace as I'm, as I'm going through this. And I think the challenging part this year was all the water, right? Cause like you said, the, yeah, last year was the desert and they didn't tarp all of the water pits and they, they put water in it and the desert loved it. It sucked it right in and you know, it <laughs> drank up, uh, this year the water stayed and there was a lot of it and it was cold. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that's the big differences between this year and last year. They both had their own challenges. And I think just the multitude of variables this year, um, created a greater challenge, right? Um, the running was easier, but the overall course was more difficult. One of the tricky things too, is the temperature. Oh, we've had previous years. I remember when I first started, man, back in, uh, 2011 and we were out in Jersey and this is when we had the 10 mile loop. Our current loops are five miles. And this is the 10 mile loops. And I would be out there all night long. I wouldn't see people for hours, man, coming through. <laughs> That's what, because when they first transitioned from 10 miles to the five mile, I was like, oh man, you know, that's Tough Mudder's signature, 10 miles, da 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 da. And I didn't think it was going to be a great idea, but I think it turned out to be an excellent idea because what I saw was one, you guys were coming in more often. I saw a, a, a constant flow of people, you know, between you guys and the people that were out there running for their personal best. And two, it was almost like two uh, uh, for those people that were coming in and you're like psychologically out of it. It was easier to say in, with the five months, okay, I'll just knock another one out and then, you know, that'll be it, you know. Uh, for you, did you ever, you never competed in our 10 mile one. You, you didn't come into the Tough, tough Mudder before. Then. When was your first Tough Mudder? What year? Uh, it was World Stuff. last year. That was my first Tough Mudder event. Oh, wow. Yeah. Were you a Spartan guy? <laughs> I did a few Spartans. I think before that, I had done like six or seven Spartans since 2018. I did my first Spartan. Uh, it was a sprint, so the 5K in 2018. Um, and then 2019, I did four events, one of each, the, the Sprint, the Super, the Beast, and the Ultra. And then nothing for... 2020, well, well, we went to the lockdown and no, um, no OCR events in 2021 either, except for World's Toughest at the end of the year, just some trail racing and stuff. But that's yeah. my obstacle course racing career right there. <laughs> and that's how it started? Man, that's pretty good. Uh, Spartan, a little more competitive, a little more testosterone running around in there. Uh, what's the difference for you with Spartan and Tough Mudder? The community. Um, the community at Tough Mudder is, is hard to beat. Like you said, uh, Spartan, it's just like, it's a, it's more competitive race. Like there's, you, you're not allowed to help people through obstacles and yeah, it's, it's a totally different environment over there. The obstacles are different. Tough Mudder has really fun obstacles and Spartan has, like, it's always the same thing, which is fine. It's like, that's the standardized event. Um, that's where you go to be competitive all year. And then I think for, World's Toughest, they really have the one, their Tough Mudder has the one real competitive event at the end of the year, World's Toughest. So it's like, uh, yeah, you can go and and battle it out all year at Spartan and you can have fun with the Tough Mudder community all year. And then when it's time to throw down, if you're into the the ultra endurance event, World's Toughest at the end of the year is the perfect, the perfect event. So yeah, the yeah. That, that makes the, the biggest difference. Yeah. And I see more, uh, I'm starting to see because of course, um, Joe DeSena, he now owns Tough Mudder also, the founder of Spartan. And I do see more Spartan athletes coming over to do the Tough Mudder races, which I love. You know, there shouldn't be some big like rivalry between them. You know, uh, all these 
all these challenges out there, whatever ultra you're running, you know, that it's got a piece of you in there that you can discover, I believe. You know? uh, are there any other races that you're doing or ultras that you're doing out there? So I'm primarily, I'm going to do a few Spartans this year and just that's going to kind of keep me, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to race through those as I target world's toughest in 2023 because I'm, I'm coming back and that's going to be my A race. Uh, besides that, I'll do some like, I'll do some trail racing and some road racing throughout the year. Um, probably I'm, I'm going to target a marathon early this year. I've never done just a road marathon and actually try to try to put some speed in my legs. Right. As opposed to just being this like durable machine, right? Like it, let's see what happens if we can actually get fast and, you know, try to get, try to get real dangerous out there and do something special one of these years. See, to me, you have the perfect build though, because you, you have just the right speed and you got the strength part of it too. This is the other thing that going from 10 miles to five miles changed was that in the 10 miler, I remember, uh, I think it was, uh, forget who the runner was. Pac was the runner, I believe. He was killing it, man, because he's a runner, you know, and so he yeah. wasn't as strong on the obstacles, but he was killing because he was a runner. And then when we dropped it to the five miles, it sort of evened the playing field there. What is your strength, running or the um, upper body? It's getting there. I'm, yeah. Uh, so I've definitely got the most experience with like weightlifting, I guess, right? And just yeah. being a, a strong and, and durable, durable person. I've just really, I've been running fairly consistently for almost five years now. But before that, I probably had a decade of just like weightlifting under my belt. So that's like, that's my base is I, I'm, I, at one point I was real strong. I, I, I had a pretty good deadlift. I could pull just over like 500 pounds. I could squat just over four. My bench press was never anything special, but that's fine because it's not really sport specific for us anyways at this point. Um, yeah, I could, I could push maybe like two, you know, just upwards of 250 on, on the bench press, but that's where, yeah, that's where my, my sports started, I guess, like my fitness journey. Um, so I would say my strength there is, is the strength, right? And the ability to, to be durable. I think that that has been a huge benefit for me over the years of running to, to keep me, keep me in the game in these long events. I think, I think the strength background is, is really powerful there, but I'm starting to get, I'm starting to become a runner. I put all the time in, I ran a heck of a lot of miles this year. Uh, some of them were fast. So, um, working on, on my weaknesses, I'd say running is still my weakness in, in this yeah. event, but it's coming together. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a lot of runners I see, it's almost like, cause when you watch the professional athletes, they have seasons. So then they'll have downtime where they can heal up from these little nagging injuries. You know, if it's a major injury and they had to have surgery, what have you, they give themselves time to heal where it seems like you guys are running all year long. You're a top shit, top fit all year long, man. Uh, what are the nagging injuries? And they won't go any further than this. None of the competitors will hear this. So. <laughs> yeah for me yeah what's, what's the kind of giving me troubles um so just after the race uh i mean my whole body was really blown up like as soon as I, I looked strong coming through that last lap and then as soon as i gave my body permission to shut it down everything everything really really fell apart like i couldn't even couldn't stand up on my own couldn't walk into the car i had my friends throw me in the car and then we drove home and then they dragged me out of the car and threw me in the shower and i just kind of let the water hit me and, and things like that. It took me a long time to recover um, muscularly, um, like seven to 10 days to really feel like like my body was was becoming itself again. And then I've got some tendons that are bugging me a little bit still. Top of my foot, anterior tibialis tendon is very, very sensitive to the touch. It's, it doesn't hurt like with any sort of mobility or activation. And then the inside of my knee all of a sudden started bugging me like 10 days into recovery. And I'm like, what the heck's going on here? So it was, it was fine before. And then the outside of my foot started to hurt a few days ago and that's, that slowly started to fade, but yeah, little things. And then, um, you know, I, I've had, I had, you know, little things that I had to avoid all year in training. Right. Like, but I did a really good job of, of listening to my body and, and just bailing on workouts. If something was, wasn't going right. Like, um, you know, not trying to be too prideful and just get something out in training because that's not that's not where you need to to use grit right you use you use uh you know some intelligence and wisdom while you while you train and make sure you don't get injured because that's the worst thing you could possibly do at the end of the day consistency wins so you just need to make sure you stay in the game but now that like this is definitely my off season i finished that race I haven't ran a step in just over two weeks now. Um, I'm probably going to get on the bike 
later today and spin, but I'm going to definitely mm. take my time and, and make sure I'm healed 100% and ready to go to jump into the 2023 season and start the build again. So yeah. Nothing I'll, major, just yeah, maintenance. How old are you? I am just turned 30. Huh, very yeah. young 30. Uh, I always <laughs> like asking my athletes, can you remember the age when you last woke up in the morning with no pain whatsoever in your body. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I have good days. I have, I have yeah. good days. So they're they're still around. Yeah. Well, you're doing something right then, <laughs> man. You're doing something right because you're coaching as uh, well. So yeah. So uh, when you're training now, because you said you could, you just jumped into it even more, uh, are you working with a coach also? Uh, so this was the first year that I was self-coached. I had been working with Joshua Reed for about two and a half years leading into 2021 World Toughest, but this year I'm self-coached. So I've updated all my own programming. And what does that consist of, your programming, your training? What is your day? Okay, so that's easy because uh, I live at the Ultra House with Anthony and sometimes like Josh is here for most of the year. We've got just like a couple of full-time athletes and coaches in the house, right? So we're all in the same mindset. We kind of go into monk mode when things get serious over here. So we're doing the same thing all day, every day with, you know, the exception of a couple of, of variables that pop up, right? Like, you know, is there a race in the morning or travel and things like that? But so we wake up around at the same time, at least as close to it as you possibly can. We're almost always doing cold exposure. So, you know, spring, summer, and fall, that would mean going to the river out back and, and hopping in and, you know, the water stayed close to like, you know, low forties, 40 to, to 45 degrees all year. So just a, a nice little soak for three to five minutes, come inside, do a little bit of mobility work, hop in the sauna, do a 30 to 50 minute session. After that, we go on our first run. And then, you know, depending on training, that could be anywhere from two to, you know, it's, you know, on a, on a normal day, like 14, 14 miles, right? Unless you got a big long run planned. And then you come in from your run, you eat food, you do everything you can to recover. You rest up. You, you If you require some more mobility work or some body work, you jump on that. And then if you could score a nap, best day ever, right? You do that. And, yeah. and that's the best thing you can do to recover. And if you can't, you work on whatever your other crack is, right? Like we all do something. Sometimes I, I play some guitar or just kind of hang out and work on on myself maybe read a little bit and then if you got workout number two of the day you go for it and then you come back in you eat again you sleep and repeat for the majority of the year yeah cj how do you do are you making a living from running from from just the the sport now? <laughs> uh no i'm not. selling crack on the side what's with meth is there a meth at the ultra house is <laughs> what's going on i know, I know nothing <laughs> yeah. about this <laughs> yeah i mean i just live i live very very frugally, as frugally as possible, so I can make this work. Yeah, uh, I I don't I don't go out. I try not to buy anything. I don't need to buy. All my money goes to calories, and yeah, yeah the, the that's overhead, a great commitment. The light man. overhead, yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's awesome. I mean, it's what it takes right now, it's, at least in my world. So, I mean, hopefully, yeah. as I start to do better at these things, I can get some more sponsorships and some endorsements and things like that and get a little bit of help and, and do this. I want to do this for as long as I can. So I'm going to make it work. I'm, I'll find a way. I'm resourceful. Yeah. Yeah. I think you'd be a great yeah. character for any, uh, in, to endorse anyone in this whole fitness industry. Uh, nutrition. How much does nutrition play yeah. in the part of your training? What are you doing with your nutrition? Yeah. So it fluctuates throughout the year, most of the time. So I, I'm, a, I'm a higher fat, lower carbohydrate athlete. Um, and what that means for the majority of the year is I just eat my carbs at dinner. That's, a, that's an easy way to explain it. I don't eat them in the morning or for lunch. And that just keeps like glucose spikes down um, and, and, and insulin and glucose regulated. So I can, the, the idea there is, is my, my A races are, are these really long events, right? And I, hopefully these, these nutritional strategies are helping me uh, metabolize fat during these events because you, you, in theory, you should have an unlimited store of them as long as you can utilize them. And then as I get closer to events, I'll start to to increase my carbohydrate intake a little bit more. Like as I got close to World's Toughest two weeks out, I really started, really, really started to bump it up and wasn't too particular about it. But I mean, I'm, I'm very rarely like in ketosis. Maybe I'll do a hard reset 
like once or twice a year where I'll just totally cut out the carbs and I'll feel like absolute garbage for like seven to 10 days and then slowly dig myself out of this hole. And just, again, just trying to not rely on the need for sugars so often. That's, that's my weakness, man. That darn shit. And I know what it <laughs> feels is. like when you kick it. I, re- I remember I went on a hard, uh, 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 where I was able to kick it. It took me about maybe a month, three weeks before I lost that craving. And then all those cliches you hear that, oh my God, your mind is clear and your energy is up there and you lose that extra weight that you're carrying, you know, it's all true. It's all true. Man. Uh, I look at you, yeah, I see I mean, your it's pictures. It's very event specific. I'm just like a caveat here, right? Like you'll, somebody will hear this and go, oh, that's wrong. That's wrong. You shouldn't be doing that. Right. And I, it's, it's event specific. It's goal specific, right? Like if you're into like some really short and spicy events and that that's your big goal for the year, you need sugars, you need carbs, you, you need, you need the glycogen stores to be able to really put high output out. So I, I know there's differences here and you know, um, yeah, it's hard to tell to tell anybody the right way to eat in a sense, but there's, there's so many different ways to go about it. And, and nutrition's a, a funny thing, but yeah, just goal specific, you know, as, as we have different things we're trying to achieve, I think there are different ways to eat to, to perform better at these events. And this is very much a thing of getting to know your own body, what works for you. Agreed. Uh, I've read, I believe like in, in 24 hours, and this is just the, the whole neural training uh, information stuff that like, Sugar sometimes, especially when you're exhausted, and I'm and I'm assuming like in these sort of endurance events, sugar sometimes is the greatest thing to feed the brain, man, because uh, you start to go numb oh, yeah. up there, you know. So that sugar rush all of a sudden sharpens you up too and gets you out of that negative mode of what the hell am I doing? Let me get out of here. Have you Definitely. gotten? Yeah. What What's the deepest you've gone uh, in that dark place uh, mentally? <laughs> that was probably this year. Honestly, uh, I had a couple of, of patches where I'm like, I would think it right. I never say these things out loud because you know, I believe in the power of your word. And um, it's like, be careful what you say, because you're always listening. Right. So I will have thoughts come through my brain. I'll be like, you know, I think I'm tired. And I'll be like, no, you're not tired. Like, no, 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 no. And I'll just start repeating that. And I don't know. There's a lot of like, I don't think I've ever gone really deep because I've never totally, I have yet to totally crash. Right. And mm-hmm. may I maintain this, this streak. So, but I mean, I had moments this year where I'm like, you know, you, you start to go over crazy, crazy things, right? You get like really deep into the event. You're, you're 16 hours in, you're like, oh, if, I, if I rolled my ankle, I could be out of this, right? <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's so many different escape routes that your brain will start to conjure, but you just, just keep telling yourself, no, keep working. So, this, and and to me, that's as much a challenge as anything else out there because the brain, <laughs> I don't think I don't think people can appreciate how much the brain uh, is, functions us as a human being, physically, mentally, all of that stuff. You know, once the brain starts saying it's time to shut down, you know, it's like you said. And all of a sudden, you start to ma- yeah, dude, just, just roll the ankle. That, nobody will say anything. <laughs> yeah. You know, you are awesome. You don't have to prove anything. Get on out of here. <laughs> you know, don't go out yeah, for that last right. lap. You know, and 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 this is. Stuff that I, I think sort of transitions not just on the course, but in life in general. Uh, this grit, this strong mind, is this something you've always had or just developing? Um, I would love to say I always had it, right? But I haven't been, I, d- I haven't had too many opportunities to be tested. Uh, once I, I realized it was something I needed and wanted to work on, I, I, I did work on it. And I think it is trainable. So, um, I had, I got sick in 2017. I was diagnosed with diverticulitis. Um, I ended up in like, I I felt like I I got stabbed or something. I was like, Oh, I got like a metal shard stuck in me somewhere. And I went to the hospital, um, and I got a scan and they saw I had diverticulitis and I had a stomach abscess that was both the size of my fists put together in my large intestine. And that kicked my butt. I was in the hospital for eight days with no food, no water. And this, at this point, I was probably in like the prime of my lifting and, you know, and, and power lifting portion of my life. And I was just about 200 pounds at the time, maybe just over. And I came out of the hospital and I was like, you know, 170, 180 pounds just in those like eight days. And I'm sure that was like, I didn't have any water. Right. So I'm really dry at this point and things like that. 
Um, <clears throat> and then I was, I was pretty good for, for quite a few months. Nothing had gone, had gone wrong. And then all of a sudden I ended up in the hospital, like every two weeks with just little attacks that were happening. It just, it, it, things would get inflamed and, you know, uh, that happened. I don't know like how long that streak went on for, but it was many, many months where I would just, I, I, all of a sudden be driving myself to the emergency room and I'd pick up antibiotics and I'd, I'd be on antibiotics for the next two weeks. I'd be good for a week and then it would come back. And, uh, I met with a surgeon. He was like, well, you can, you can live your life like this and just continuously start, you know, can continue to eat antibiotics and, and stay alive and, and feel good. Or we could, we could try to remove the, the damaged portion. Right. So I elected for surgery that I had in February of 2000. And 18, where they pulled out the the bad bit of my large intestine, and I've been I've been totally fine ever since. So I'll, I'll knock on wood right here and, and and keep that streak alive. But as soon as I finished that, I was like, um, I I think I was like 150 or so pounds at this wow. point. So I'm like, I just lost like 50 pounds of of gains that I had worked on over over the last like decade or so, and I'm I'm still kind of strong, but like my, maybe my body wants to be lighter so maybe i won't try to put that back on and i'm going to change focus and i'm going to i'm going to try the endurance side of things right like i just cuz i was laying in bed and like i couldn't do anything and then i was really happy to walk down the stairs one day and like i got to the bottom of the stairs and walked a quarter mile and then you know just kind of escalated things from there and that was my catalyst to be like i wonder what you can do and i i knew i wasn't the fastest or the fittest but i knew i could I could be the most enduring. So I, and that would require mental grit. So I've done a lot of things over the past few years to, to grow that side of, of me, you know, the ability and will to, to endure. I do think it's trainable. Yeah. I, again, I look at your, uh, your Instagram, which is, uh, for anybody, again, listening, D lowercase J lowercase Fox. So D E E lowercase. Uh, J A Y lowercase Fox F O X on Instagram and the pictures on there, dude. You look, you look to, again peak <laughs> performance fit. I don't know if those are the only times you take a picture. You know, you know, you know, during Thanksgiving or during the holidays after the meal, you're not taking pictures of yourself, but you you look again like ready, performance ready, twenty four hours every day. Um, how far is your walking weight? to your performance weight, uh, in life. Just. Yeah. I probably floated between 158 and 162 pounds for the past, like three or four years. Um, I'm pretty tight. Not a lot of changes. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. you know, I'll, I'll be fitter in certain moments. Right. And not to say like 162 is less fit or less ready than 158 or, or vice versa. Right. It's just kind of, um, yeah, I just let my body do its thing. I put the training in. I eat the right amount of food. And yeah, I I stay ready. I don't ever let myself get too far off. I haven't yet. You know, I haven't had anything come into my life that has that has caused me to fall off off course too far. And I intend to keep it that way. Yeah. Okay, so what were the highlights uh, for the race for you? World Toughest Mudder. What can you remember that uh, stands out for you? <laughs> um, I mean, obviously the finish line, right? That, that's the biggest highlight. That was the the pinnacle of the event for me. But besides that, it's like, I, I really enjoyed the start of the race as well. I remember that just kind of sitting on the start line and you got your speech going and you're hyping everybody up, getting everybody jazzed, ready to, to go into battle for the day. And I'm, I'm, I'm listening intently, but I just kind of sit with my eyes closed and I stay relaxed and I get into this this mindset of like, let's get ready. You know, we're, we're going to go out and we're going to put everything out on the field today. So let's, let's prepare for, <laughs> for the battle ahead. Right. Um, yeah. I, I really enjoy that part. It's like, you're starting to get antsy and, and get all, get all jazzed up, but you keep, keep things fairly mellow. And then I had the opportunity to run with, with a lot of friends as well. And that's always highlight like early on, I'm running with my buddy, David Carta. Um, and we had to run two or three laps together. And that was, I really cherish those moments as well. Um, I met a nice guy out there named Nicodemus, um, Nick De La Rosa. I don't know what his actual name is or <laughs> where, I'm, <laughs> where I'm making small errors, but we ran, you know, we ran half a dozen laps together and just kind of 
toggling back and forth between each other. So we had some really good conversations and I really, I really enjoy those moments too. They make, they make hours kind of tick by. Yeah. Yeah. And you had and Javier in your pit. Um, oh yeah. Javier in the pit. That's always, that's always magical. Um, I raced against him last year. Right. And then to have yeah. him on my side this year and, and helping me out, that was beautiful. Um, you know, he recorded a couple little videos that I put on Instagram and where, you know, I don't know, he just had the right things to say where we were coming into the event, driving in. I'm like, I'm coming home. I'm coming home with champ today out here. And he's like, Oh yeah. I'm like, yeah, dude, watch. We're going to, you know, we'll see. And then <laughs> going out for uh, my, my 21st lap. So 105 miles, he points the camera at me and he's like, so we got to keep this up. Can you do it? I'm like, yep. He's like, and then what? And then we're world champions. Like, and then you're the world champion. You know and I'm like? That moment will live with me forever. I love that. And I'm happy to have it on video as well. It was, dude, an amazing day. There's so many things I could talk all day about the the beautiful moments of it. Yeah. I had Javier on the podcast. I think he may have been my very first interview, in fact, for this podcast. Yeah, which a, a great person to have, man. Very driven. Yeah. And I was talking to him uh, while he was pitting for you because he was out there too the whole time, man. And and I told oh, yeah. dude, you must be feeling it at the bit, man, that you want to be out here <laughs> competing, you know. And and I'm I'm pretty sure that came from watching you coming in, man, that you're inspiring the hell and getting those juices flowing in him also. That's so cool that uh this is another thing that I love about this sport, uh, is that how you guys relate to each other as competitors. It's one of those things that I loved in like uh, the the X Games, how all those they were always they're very competitive, but very supportive to each other. And I feel that among you guys, you elite runners too. Uh, do you see that? Most definitely, yeah. Um, like on race day, we're there to to beat you by a second if that's all it takes, right? Um, but we're still going to support you. We're gonna, we'll help you over obstacles, um, and then all year round, like you know, we talk to each other, we give each other training advice, we support each other. We want it. We want your best version of you on the day, always. So we're we're here to support each other, right? Like, you know, we don't we don't want to be you when you're at fifty you percent know, of yeah. your potential. So yeah, yeah. It's it's funny. Yeah. I used to watch my my nephews when they were playing like uh, uh, the video games and all that stuff, and they would stack their team, whatever team it might sport it might be, with all the best players. And I'm like, guys, where's <laughs> yeah. the fun in that? Where's the achievement? Do you feel in that? Because I've always been coming up, you know, I was super competitive as a kid, but I always liked to beat the best. You know, like if we were picking teams, I wouldn't pick the best guys out there. You know, and, and I remember one yeah. year, this is about me now. Uh, I remember one year <laughs> <laughs> uh, in high school and I, I had six period PE, you know, and I wasn't in sports. I was more into music at the time, but my brother was a great athlete. So uh, that's where I had my sports uh, connection and competitiveness. But the football team, it just came off their season. So they were in the sixth period with us. And I had this team, we were doing flag football and I had a team. It was like this one little guy and the rest of them were the girls from like, uh, uh, their different sports, um, uh, track, I believe Dude, we went undefeated. That was like one of the most satisfying I, uh, competitions I had been in because again, I want to, I want to take on people at their best. I want your best. You know, that's how I feel about it. And I think that's what I see among you guys when you're out there. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, that's why I was really happy. Like, unfortunately, the other event got canceled, right? Spartan Ultra Champs. But I was like, oh, nice. Now these people are, they, they were training for a 24 hour race. This is the only one they're coming here, right? Now the depth of field is, is dense. If you be, if you win today, you beat everybody, you beat the best. So it's amazing. Yeah. I was really excited to hear that. You know, that's why I didn't like a, I was bummed Mark didn't get to show up. The the yeah. rainy, the the previous 2021 yeah. champ, right? Like you want everybody there. You want, you want it's gonna push everybody, you know? Absolutely, man. I talked about high school. I always like with uh, with my guests to go back, way back yeah. to let's <laughs> let's go back to little DJ. Where was little DJ born, raised? What was life like for little DJ that got him to where he is now? Yeah, born and raised in Auburn, New York. So it's like uh, central New York area, the closest major city that people might recognize is Syracuse. I was like 35 miles southwest of Syracuse. <clears throat> um, yeah, for the most part, I think the first sport I ever picked up uh, was bowling. I bowled from like eight years old. 
uh, till I was 20. I got 12, wow. yeah, 12 years of, of bowling prowess under my belt. So yeah, that was, that was my thing for, for, for quite a long time. That's what I was going to be good at. That's where my time was invested into. And then outside of that, like I skateboarded and, and things like that, snowboarded a little bit. So, um, and then I, I played, you know, like little league baseball for a few years and I had a couple years of, of basketball and I don't even know how old I was when I did these. I was, I was really young. So I played most sports. I think I, I kicked a soccer ball for a couple of years for some indoor soccer, but my main thing was bowling. Uh, that's what I really liked. That's where I spent all my time at. I'd wake up every morning. I I'd go down to the alley and I would bowl 10 games and, and come home and then get on my skateboard for a little while. So, um, yeah. And then, uh, yeah, got to, to high school, bowled right through high school. I did a year of track in my freshman year and I ran hundred meter dash and high jump and not even fast hundreds. I was like 12, 13 seconds. So nothing spectacular there. Uh, then no track the following year. Still the focus was on bowling, jump back into track my junior year, did the same thing, hundreds and high jump. Um, I don't think my times got any faster, 13, 12 seconds and <laughs> decent high jump. I think I jumped like almost six feet at one point. So that was, that was, nice. that was acceptable for my, nice. my five foot nine self. But again, <laughs> still, still just bowling. That was, that was the focus. And then I played, or I golfed for, I think, three years of high school and I got pretty, pretty decent at that as well. So. Those were my major sports growing up. That's how I have grown to where I am today. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know golf, golf challenges you mentally and, you know, it'll drive you nuts. Oh, yeah. I know. <laughs> but bowling, too, I believe, you know, uh, uh, when the pressure's on and you got to do this frame has to be perfect. and You got to remember that the feeling yeah. of that technique of getting the ball out there. Bowling for a long time. How come you didn't go pro? I just... All of a sudden, didn't want to do it anymore. I don't know. Twelve years of it. I was. I did it competitively for a long time. I did it competitively in high school and then competitively in college. And I think I like I graduated high school, maybe like second or third in the state. Like I was decent at it, right? And um, yeah, I started to 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 train some other things. Like I had started lifting at this point, right? And I wanted to kind of get strong and like use fitness and starting to get into it a little bit. But yeah, I don't know. I just lost it one day. To be totally honest, um, I remember I had, so this is, yeah, be careful what you say to, to people because they're listening, right? I had had a coach come up to me at one point and, you know, be like, just so you know, you gotta, you gotta come up with a career. You can't bowl forever. And I'm like, hmm. And I just remember that. I kind of like, I heard a little bit, right? I was like, this is literally what I'm doing. This is the plan. Honestly, I'm going to go. There's some decent tournaments out there and, and I can win. Um, but yeah, I'm a little off putting. Not to say that like that totally took it out of me. You know that that didn't totally pull the wind out of my sails. But I just like I'd done it for a long time, and I think I was done. That's all. Uh, that's too bad. He said that. Yeah, if, if I remember, yeah. and, and Bolin had a peak moment too. Man. It, it almost looked <laughs> like the guys were getting fit. <laughs> you know, you would have been the fittest <laughs> guy in bowling. I think you would have been the Tiger Woods of bowling, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you yeah, were about I to mean, say you start with a lot of things. Yeah. Oh, I say bowling. I learned. I learned some stuff from there that I've been able to carry over. Nothing big, but like the importance of like consistency and you know pre-shot routine and getting yourself in into a specific mindset before you do anything. Just yeah, little things that I took away from it. It served its purpose in my life. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, World toughest mutter. Getting back to that one. Now people will look at it and they'll they'll think of it as uh you know it's a uh, um a one person sport you know, that you're going up. It's just you mm -hmm. out there. But uh, I tell people, no, they got a pit out there that's helping them out, you know, just like you see in like the NASCARs right. and stuff like that, that play a very important part to competition. How important is your pit for you? Oh, I couldn't do without it. I wouldn't have gotten close to achieving what I achieved this year without, without my picker, right? Like I put, a, I put a plan together and I put a perfect plan together. And then I was like, okay, here's all the potential places that we're going to diverge from the plan. Right. Um, yeah, but yeah, so it's like the, you, that requires effort and energy as well. Like my girlfriend didn't leave the quick pit spot for 24 hours this year. And she didn't leave the quick pit spot for 24 hours last year. So she was ready with everything I needed, my plan. And then my, my potential, uh, like contingency plans. Um, at one point I had come in to put my wetsuit on this year 
And I tied my shoes like adequately tight at the start of the race, but now we're, you know, almost 10 hours in and my feet have swelled up and it took all the slack out of my shoes. And I, I tied the night, the knot a little too tight, I believe. And I couldn't untie it. And then they couldn't untie it as well. And Javier actually bit my shoelace and untied my shoelace <laughs> with his teeth. So yeah. And like, I don't know how long I would have been stuck there in my shoes if I, if he wasn't willing to, and I didn't ask, like he just realized he couldn't do it. And, and used his teeth and, and tied my shoes. And I'm like, I, wow. I couldn't have done that. Yeah. Wow. It, That's it pretty cool. Team. It takes everybody. Yeah. It takes everything. Um, there's, you'd have a really hard time in this event if you just wanted to do it with no help and do it solo. Right. I don't know, like lay a table out for you or something and come by and grab your things. But there's little things count in this, in this race. Little things add up quite a bit. So right. couldn't do it without them. How long, have you, how, how long have you been together with your girlfriend? Five years. And she supports you <laughs> all a hundred percent through the, all of this. Yeah. Like she was there, right. I met her and then I got sick and ended up in the hospital and changed my whole life. And she's, she, so she hung around. So <laughs> she's done the whole thing with me. Yeah. We, uh, I met her in Texas. We moved in, in New York together. I was living in a hotel at the time. She moved into the hotel, um, which was pretty awesome. Then we got, I had my surgery. We moved into an apartment, um, that was you know, a couple towns down. And then, I got out of that and I, I ended up getting uh, a sales job and that was better off living in just like, I don't know, you know, a couple hours down the road. So we stayed there and I, you know, ended up bailing on the sales job because I wasn't passionate about it. So I got a job in, in the gym and I started coaching and doing it all full time. And I'm like, I got these crazy ideas. How do they sound to you? And she's like, if you're in, go for it. Right. And then had a good world's toughest last year and said, I think I want to move to Colorado and pursue this full time. You want to come? And she's like, hundred percent. Zero question. Oh. She's always been there. Yeah. She's ready to roll. Very cool. What's it's her amazing. name? Again. Yeah. Like uh, her, her name is Aranza. It's Aaron. Aranza. That's pretty. Very pretty. Uh, uh, I always do this in stand up whenever I'm doing uh, comedy and I see a couple like sitting up front. I, I'm just always curious how they met because usually it's always a good story. And us guys didn't know that we were out of control of the whole fair situation. How did you and Aranza <laughs> yeah. meet? Uh, so I was in Texas for my friend uh, to graduate uh, his boot camp for the Air Force. Um, and I actually met her on Tinder while I was down there. So we're, we're a success story for, for internet dating. That stuff works. Yeah, <laughs> it does. It can. Yeah, it yeah. really can. Yeah, I think I think I got very very lucky with my with my selection being down there, and then yeah, discovering her on the, on the internet. But yeah, it worked. Yeah, and it seems like they have an app for any kind of dating pairing now for whatever you need. You know, uh, Tinder you chose. You know, you it could have been. It's there. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, I want to start an app, Sean. Well, I'm married now. Hold on. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's not a Sean Corville's dating app. You know, that's it. Just dating me. That's it. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. You have this great thing I see on your your uh, uh, your Instagram. Finally lost my mind. Feel free to join me. Where did that come from? What is that saying? Uh, that was me, you know, deciding to break away from the the normal world you right or what kind of people expect you to do i'm like i don't know it's like i see this path and i've been on it and i don't like it and everybody i talked to about you know jumping ship from this was like that's crazy like you know you got a good job you make good money you can have a career and you can buy your things and you can retire happily and healthily and wealthily right and i was like i don't know i didn't like it um it wasn't for me my days were not spent uh, the way i thought they should be spent. It didn't feel right. And um, regardless of what everybody said, I made the jump. They said, you're absolutely crazy. And I don't know, here's to the crazies, man. I think, I think if you feel the, the draw to something, you need to do it. If you look back, you know, if I would have done all that and, you know, I retire happily at 65, 70 years old, right? I'm like, what if I didn't? What if I did this thing? And could I have, could I have won these championship events that I, that I really, you know, that my heart called yeah. to, you know, and I did. So it's, it's worth it. So it's like, you got to go pursue whatever you want to pursue. And otherwise you never know. And I think that's the worst thing you could ever do to yourself. 
Way to follow your heart, so man. That's I went crazy. I went crazy, and I think you should. I think you should go crazy too. <laughs> well, the, I I would it, say I, in I the would, circle. The fruitful path. Yeah, I got. I I say in the circle to the people that were there. Uh, you know, at the regular tough mutters when when I'm talking to them. You know, I'm like a lot of you, probably a hundred percent of you here, have heard in your lifetime somebody look at you and say, "You're crazy. You're nuts." Mm-hmm. I say, wear that like a badge of honor. You know, because people only judge you when when they're uh, threatened and usually it's something in themselves that they're not addressing. So, you know, they throw it at you. And I said, yeah, tell them, yeah, yeah, I am. Come and join me. So now that I see this, I'm going to say it like like DJ Fox say, come and join. Yeah. <laughs> come and join. Yeah. It's, it's liberating. It's here. Yeah. 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 Yeah, but again, it takes some bravery, man, to to go after these things, to commit like this. It does. Yeah, so it wasn't easy necessarily, right? Um, you know, I did have security with with life and the things you're supposed to have security with, and I had to I had to be open to abandoning those, you know, and, and going into the unknown. And it was exciting. It's fun, I man. It's it's over every step. So. Yeah. Yeah. So how are you feeling? Where are you at with life in general now? Are you feeling good? Everything's happening like you want it to? Yeah, I feel great. I feel like the universe is conspiring in my favor at the moment. So um, everything, everything's going great. Living happily, living healthily. Yeah, I feel I'm in a very good, I'm in a very good place. I'm at, I'm at peace with everything happening around me. So I'm going to, I'm going to keep doing my thing and following my, my life with blind faith and, you know, I'm just understanding that what I do today is setting me up for tomorrow and a year from now. So, Yeah. Um, do you map out your race plan for the year? Yes. Yeah. So I'll put the A race on the calendar and then anything else that I, I fill in the gaps with. I just try to understand and believe that those things are leading me to my A goal. But yeah, I'll, I will yeah. map the whole year out. And then have some gaps and, and fill things in with, with you know, some local races or things that I'm, I'm like, okay, that's not going to beat me up, but it could be a good intensity session, like run a 5K or you know, 10K or half marathon. Yeah. I'll and you said you, uh, and you're doing coaching, uh, but I believe it's virtual coaching, online coaching. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. It's all online right now. I don't, I don't have a job in a gym. Um, I'm just doing coaching for endurance athletes online. Yeah. So how does that work? If I want to say, hey, DJ, help me out, man. I need you to help me. How does that start? I just call you up. We, we call on the phone or online once a day. What, yeah. What is- yeah, so to, to get things rolling, you can send me a message on Instagram. Again, the handle is at D-E-E underscore J-A-Y underscore F-O-X, DJ Fox. Um, yeah, let me know that you're interested and we'll set up a council call. I'll reach out to you. Uh, we'll... Uh, discuss goals and, and ideas a little bit. And first things first is, you know, we'll make sure we, we seem like we're a good fit for each other for the athlete coach relationship. After that, we'll set up your calendar and I'll, I'll program, you know, week by week, um, to, to, to give you workouts and program you towards your goals. Right. And then obviously as we kind of get to know each other a little bit more, I can program a little bit farther out, but, and then, 24 seven open communication. If you got questions, you reach out to me. I use a really cool app called Training Peaks. So you can see all of your workouts right on your phone, really easily accessible. If you got smart watches and things like that, all your workouts will automatically upload to that, which will upload to my side so I can see everything you're doing. And then yeah, weekly phone call or video chat so I can talk to you and, and try to really get a good idea of how you're adapting to all these workouts and the stresses and the stimulus and make sure things are going well, right? And keep you on track. So it's just a, an individualized, customized program that you know, could potentially change week to week, depending on what you need. Or again, once we really get the ball rolling, uh, we can, we can plan significantly farther in the future, but yeah, customized, individualized programs. And, and let me just throw this out here. Okay. This is just me adding on to it. Not just if you're a runner, you know, just an athlete out there, uh, uh, in the elements, but if you're a bowler, this is the man you want to talk to, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he will make you the I most. I know a lot. <laughs> yeah. You'll be the most strong-minded bowler out there on on the uh, on the tour, man. Uh, yeah, you know, real quick too, before I get you out of here, because um, I've been in the fitness industry for many, many, many years, and 
one of the things like I see at the Tough Mudder events and uh, even in competitors like yourselves is that these things that you guys are doing out there on the course, in your sport, the way you're training and you being a trainer, I always felt like, uh, especially with you guys, you personal trainers uh, connecting with the clients, that you see that people, it, it's not just about the physical for people out there. And what they're doing in that moment, I've said before, it's kind of a microcosm of how they're taking on the challenges in their life in general, even off the course or whatever it is that they're doing. You know, so what you guys are helping them with, to me, is that, that survival you know, honing their survival instincts, take on these challenges. Do you feel that part of it in not just being in the athlete, but also the coach, the trainer? Yeah, most definitely. Um, you know, just to, to talk to somebody after a, a successful event and, you know, see the little, the little glimmer in their eye and how excited they were to just, because a lot of the people I work with, they just, you know, they, they're not trying to go out and, and be world beaters, right? Like they want to complete events. And then once they complete it now, now we'll start to talk about it. Can they do it faster and things like that? Yeah, but it's like the drive they have to do these things, even with all the other things happening in their life, right? And it's like stress is stress. So you have to take all of these things into consideration. Do you work? Do you have kids? Like what what is adding up, right? Because we only have so much capacity to deal with these things. And yeah, to see somebody achieve these these physical feats on top of everything else they have going on in life is it's pretty special and yeah yeah working with these like, they're high achievers in all aspects of life and to throw one more thing into the mix is is challenging you know for, for me potentially at times and for them but you know anybody can anybody can overcome it and get it done yeah yeah and and for anybody listening again man uh those achievements as well as the failures you know that don't kill you Again, that don't maim you for life, that you survive. Hold on to that feeling. You know, those achievements, let that be the drive for everything you do in life. You know, to get to that feeling, I don't know, whatever you're doing, you know, uh, that's how I feel anyway. So, uh, yeah, these things, they, they, they bleed into other, into other aspects of your life, right? Like your, your success in business can help you be successful in fitness and vice versa. So just start to build momentum and then keep it going. You can, you can use it in your whole life. There you go. Uh, okay, I'm gonna get you out of here. Got three questions for you. The first one: uh, great beard, man. Any beard grooming tips? <laughs> Especially as an athlete out there doing what you're doing. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, yeah, just every once in a while we trim it. I I normally don't do it on my own. I let you know a roommate or somebody else grab a pair of of clippers and and just shape it a little bit. But I do absolutely nothing to this thing. I let it go crazy. Do you have some flair no about place. you? Look at the, the hair, the, 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 the beard looks awesome. You know, got the great smile. I'm telling you, you should be yeah, running somebody's it. product. <laughs> I agree. I agree. I'm here. Yeah. We, should have some, we should negotiate, reach out. So my two final questions to you, sir, the two questions I ask of all my guests, fun questions. One is a quote. If you've been to any Tough Mudder event, you've heard me talk about this quote. It was passed down to me by one of our legionnaires, a gentleman named Craig. I got to visit Craig in the hospital a few years uh, just before he passed away of cancer a few years ago. And he said when he was diagnosed, he started living by this quote. It became a model for him. It became a model for me. I brought it back to Mudder Nation. And over the years, they made it so popular. It actually became a song by Darius Rucker, which you were at. Uh, last year's World Toughest Mudder in the Valley. And what a coincidence, a cosmic coincidence so good. that Darius Rucker was literally across the street in that amphitheater and did that song at nighttime. I don't know if you were able to hear it, but... Uh, uh, I did. I remember hearing it. I'm like, this is perfect. Just, it just awesome. Than this. <laughs> yeah, 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 just awesome. So my question, the quote, sir, when was the last time you did something for the first time? When was it? What was it? Yeah, so that would be earlier this year. I, I really, I left my hometown, right? Like I've been like to small outskirts of, of Auburn, New York, but I made the big jump and I moved out of state and, you know, said, I'm going to, I'm going to go all in on something. You know, so it was the first time I decided I'm, I'm 100% in on this endeavor and it required big changes to move away from family and to move out of state and, you know, leave friends behind and just know I'm not going to see people for a long time. So I moved. Yeah. 
Great. Yeah. Again, Copper very, everything. very brave. Hey, how does the family support all this? Uh, they must be proud of you. I'm guessing if you guys are tight and all that. Yeah, we're real tight. It's funny. It's like, they like, we wish you were here, right? But we know you're doing your thing and we kind of get it. And then after I pulled it together this year, it was like, okay, like, and they saw, they saw the race. Like they were looking in live at the live feed that the OCR report did and they did a fantastic job. And like, we didn't, we didn't really know what you were doing, but we get it now, you know? So cool. they, yeah, especially, you know, you, you pull everything together at the, you know, like, see, it was, it was worth it. It was worth it. I had goals <laughs> and we got them done. <laughs> <laughs> and Not more to crazy. come. Some more to come. Yeah. yeah. You put you're putting the name out there, man, making all the Fox proud. Uh yeah, a lot of support for my family though. Awesome. My final question, sir. Okay, you're out there doing your thing, sure. uh, out there on the trail, you're exercising, you come across a lamp. You do what everybody does when they pick up a lamp, you wipe it off. Out pops me the genie in the lamp. Been in there for millions and trillions of centuries. I am so happy that you finally freed me. DJ. David, Joseph, I am not going to give you three wishes. I'm going to give you the ultimate gift. And in this moment, I am going to give you the undivided attention of the world. In this moment, the whole world stops what it's doing and they're listening to you. What do you say to the world in this moment? Hmm. It's an awesome question. And I would have to say that no matter what it is that, you know, how, how you're being drawn to something. Um, and it's probably big and scary, but you need to do it. You need to pursue your dreams. You never want to look back at, you know, the end of a life and just wonder what if. So never allow yourself to wonder what it always, always accept the challenge. Um, as big and scary as it might be, you need to, you need to act and you should do it now. Well said. Thank you for this, my man. Uh, I hope more to come. I'm looking forward to seeing you out there. On, uh, even just coming and, and just next time I see you at a Tough Mudder period, I'm putting the mic in your hand. Say something to the people. You, you're very inspirational. So I'm going to put a mic I'm in, in here. Yeah, I'd love to. <laughs> cool. All right. Thanks a lot, TJ. So, <laughs> thank you so much for the time. This has been great. I appreciate it. You can find Tough Mudder on Facebook and Twitter. That will be at Tough Mudder or on Instagram, also at Tough Mudder. Please remember you can find this podcast, No Excuses, on wherever you listen to podcasts. Guys, subscribe. Uh, uh, let me know what you like, what you're not liking, and I will be including you as much as possible and even more in the future. Inspirational. Inspired. Inspire. No excuses. Motivational. Be motivated. Motivate. No excuses. No whining. No quitting. Overcome. No excuses. Community. Community. Teamwork. Teamwork. Tough mutter. Tougher, Tougher together. together. No excuses.